Hello. Can you guys hear me? This works? Awesome. I am very, very excited to be here. I have not given a talk in Boston before. And um, I have to say, though, that this weather thing is really messing, up, messing with my mojo. Because I've had to redo the intro to my talk like three times already. Because I was thinking, OK, I'm going to an island. It's going to be warm. It's going to be nice. We're going to hang, like the 200 of us are going to hang out and have a great time. And I was very excited. So I had this intro. That I was thinking of this intro to talk with like nice umbrellas for the sun and nice uh, cocktail glasses and beach chairs and stuff. And I actually did check the, the weather uh, forecast as well. And then it said, oh, it's going to be fine. And then I arrived here yesterday. And I was like, crap. But it's fine. Then I had, uh, I was like, OK, I'll just redo the intro. And then I was like, oh, I just made fun of the fact that it's always raining here and the weather is crappy. And then I had that intro. And then now it's actually nice again. <laughs> so I don't really know what to do about it, except um, put. <laughs> Um, yes, this is, the, this is the best thing I could get. But anyhow, <laughs> um, I was very, initially when I saw that there's a Wicked Good Ember uh, this year, I, I was in, in Europe, and I wasn't sure whether I actually want to make the trek all the way here. But then when I realized it's on this island, and this is where, where the part where I would say, oh, and we're going to have it's awesome weather, and everything would have gone otherwise. Uh, but when I realized that we're going to be on this island, it's going to be awesome, I, I decided I really have to come here. And then I looked at the RFP, and I was like, well, I should really submit a talk. But at the time, I was feeling kind of lazy. And trust me, feeling lazy really gets to you, catch, catches up with you at some point in your life. I was feeling kind of lazy. So I was like, I don't really have a new talk I want to give. But, but we can do the Ember seems to be just a couple of days after we're going to release Ember 2.0 and Ember Data 2.0. So I was like, Let's just talk about that. Let's just say uh, we released Ember Data 2.0. Uh, and that is not among the wisest things I've done. <laughs> because giving the talk four days after you're supposed to be releasing something leads to maybe, especially if it involves both talk preparation, traveling, and releasing all at the same time, leads to a bit of a stressful life for a few days. Um, so. Actually, this is the, by far the most stress I've had for a week, because also a client of mine has a release this week. Um, so I would put uh, actually giving the stock on the, on the list of some of the unwisest things I've done. <laughs> and actually, I have, I have, I have basically given, uh, I thought about this. I was like, yeah, I mean, I'll just say yeah, we released it, and I'll talk about what we've done. But immediately, I've started having doubts. Because I was like uh, uh, thinking, well, what happens if we screw up? And then I th thought, well, even if we screwed up, even if we didn't release, I mean, what is po the, the worst possible thing that could happen? And then I started thinking about that. And I was like, you have 200 Ember developers whom you hyped all these releases with you on an island <laughs> <laughs> in the middle of nowhere for two days. So, so basically, that added, <laughs> that sounded very similar to, to, to a horror movie I watched where, where the, this is actually also an island in Massachusetts, so, which made me very, very stressed and, and very scared. But fear not, we have not released because IE8 screwed us literally 15 minutes ago when we were supposed to push the release. We have an IE8 bug, but we have branched the release. And sometimes during my talk or immediately after, we, would, we are going to have released the Ember Data stable release. Um, <laughs> so hopefully I'm safe, at, le at, least, for, for, <laughs> at least for this uh, couple of days here. But before I, and I'm very, very excited for this release. We have a lot of people have worked on it for a very long time. And I'm very excited to, to talk about it. But before I, I, I go into specifics and I, and I talk, to, uh, talk to you about the, the actual release, let me just talk a bit about the philosophy and ideas of releasing and versioning and, and, and basically how uh, version numbers and our releases work. Because if I really wanted to get away from the whole fact that if we had missed this release, we could have released anything and called it like 1.0 and, and been like, yeah, we have a 1.0. This is a release. And basically, 
there seems to be like lots of people have very different opinions about uh, release versions and sample and, and version numbers, and it seems to uh, get into very heated uh, debates. So I would. Uh, before I actually show you what the, the newest Ember data release is, I just want to first talk a bit about how we think about releases and, and what version numbers represent to, to us. So for example, if you think about different projects and, and their versioning strategies, they, they vary very widely. For example, you have uh, un, uh, libraries like under, Underscore that don't really be believe in Semver. Uh, you have, uh, for example, languages like Java, which don't believe in, in, in integers. Uh, <laughs> and um, you also have different philosophies. You, you have people who claim that you cannot run out of numbers. But then apparently, if you're Linux, you can run out of, run out of numbers. Because literally, the, the argument for why Linux is 3.0 is because they don't want to go past 40. And the number is too high, so let's release a 3.0 for, 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 the, for, the, uh, for the 20 years of, of Linux. Or if, you have, or if you have like a real product, if you have like Gmail, you have kind of a version that says beta, <laughs> but then you have no version number. And it really kind of ties down not, to your personal, not only to your personal philosophy and how you think about uh, the world, it also ties down really tightly to your dev processes. So for example, if you have, if you have a small startup, if you have a small product, your, your dev process is basically Re, uh, write tests, make them fail, make them pass, and then refactor. And your product probably won't even have uh, release versions because your release cycles are so fast that every day you're releasing at least a couple of times. If you are a big, huge company with a lot of marketing, uh, pu with a lot of marketing pushes, you can think about your, your dev process being like, well, we'll release a lot of new features one year, and then next year we'll just polish them up, and then basically you have a two kind of two-step release process where every next release is either a lot of new features or a lot of polish. And I think that for a lot of projects, that that kind of versioning system tends to work really well. If you're, uh, for example, Linux, your dev process is probably uh, send PRs to Linux and hopes hope he doesn't smite you with his anger, and <laughs> and hopefully they eventually get in. But when I think about the Ember's uh, development process. Uh, and when I try to think about how it works, well, some people would say that the Ember's uh, development process is remarkably simple and easy. It's basically go bother Rojax and tell him your problems and then see your problems resolved the next day. Um, but I would argue that, that Ember's release process in a lot of practical terms resembles Intel's release process with, with the famous uh, TikTok release, releases where Intel, if you ever, ever looked at their processors, has kind of also a two-step release process in which one year they release a new architecture of their, of their processor, and the next year they just use a, a smaller gates and smaller transistors and, and use the same exact architecture but just make it smaller and faster. And the next year after that they release another uh, architecture version, and the next year after that they, they, they uh, make it smaller again. And, uh, until like a couple of years ago when, we, when our processes stopped getting faster and now we just pay them money because they, they ship, Apple ships new Macs. Um, but, basically, <laughs> um, but, but basically, Intel, Intel has this very, had this very, very stable release process. And I kind of think about uh, Ember's release process in, in the same way, where we also have a tick and a talk, except we don't release processors, we release software. So what we do is, we refactor existing code, and we have big band releases that don't add many new features, even though they're very hyped. Like with Intel, what, what people care about and, and what, uh, what gets hyped a lot of the times is the new architecture, the new things you can do with the processor. But for engineers and the people who really care, you know that that's not really the important part. The important part is the refactoring. It's, it's reducing the, the, the transistors and the process size, because everything that's enabled us to, to get fast computers has basically been just the ability to make smaller and smaller processors. So for Ember, we kind of hype our refactor releases much more. So for example, if we go to some of the recent uh, releases, uh, we, the Ember had like a Metal Views release that uh, got rid of the strip tags. And while that was almost a feature, because you don't have to look at, look at them, and uh, people don't troll you about them anymore, and uh, you, your CSS works better, this release did not actually add many new features, but it was extremely important and hyped because it enabled other releases that would add features. 
So for the, uh, another good, even better example is the Ember.js 1.9. If you look at 1.9, you, you'll see that the big thing that, that we released then was the streams refactor, that refactored how templating works. But that, if you just started using 1.9, uh, this refactor wouldn't give you that much benefit. You would maybe code run a bit faster, or maybe if you looked at the internals, they made a lot of sense, but there wasn't many new features. But yet, if you go to Ember, Ember 1.10 and 1.11, you start getting a lot of really cool things. You get, for example, the component helper. That's a new feature based on this refactor and is basically only 50 lines of code because this refactor enabled it. And you get, for example, the new helpers API that we uh, that got the IFC got implemented and merged recently, and this is also being enabled by, by the streams refactor. So we, what, what ends up happening is, is you get a release that everybody's very excited about that actually adds no new features, and then over time you reap the rewards of, of these releases. Uh, a great uh, example is the, the very, very hyped HTML bars release, which was in Ember 1.10. Everybody was super excited about it. If you looked at Ember 1.10, it was neither that much faster, neither it had any new features. But then if you look at a couple of releases afterwards and, and what we got from, uh, from HTML bars, you got the bind adder, you got the inline if, and it, it kind of paved the way for, for, the, for the new Glimmer engine. And basically, that, I think that this is a really important way of thinking about Ember's releases because you'll hear a lot of people be very excited about something and then it lands and you look at it and you're like, well, this doesn't seem to actually affect me in my day-to-day -day work. But the reason that people are excited about it is because they're developers and they're excited about all the, well, first by getting to look at much, much cleaner code every day when they work on it, but mostly because you get, you, will, you end up reaping the rewards over time over multiple releases and multiple new features. And, and for me personally, releasing features does not feel nearly as good as refactoring, because releasing features mean you, you could screw up and you have to support it for throughout the version, while refactoring just means you're cleaning your, your own crap to, uh, that, that you added earlier. Um, so again, Glimmer it made everything faster and is a huge refactoring, but the even more important value of it is are all the uh, new features that, that are coming in the Ember 2.0 cycle. Uh, if, uh, if you've been following the Ember RFCs, there's a lot of discussion about the new uh, component style and a lot of things that, happen, that are coming to Ember, mostly because that are enabled by, by this big band release. So how does this apply to, to my talk? And is this like a, just a giant di diversion uh, from, from, <laughs> from, from, from trying to talk about, uh, uh, about Ember's release? But basically, I, in the last year and a half, I, I think Ember Data had lots of releases like that that were large refactorings and features, partially features, that then enabled uh, much better future work. So for example, we had the, the really big, in the last year and a half, we had a really big single source of truth branch that fixed uh, relationships and, and, and um, loading of relationships and, and changing of relationships immediately. But it also enabled, uh, in later releases, a bunch of new features. So we got better rollback in new records. Uh, we got better removing deleted records from arrays. And we, it also paved the way for some of the relationship rollback that, that we are going to add. Or for example, the find coalescing, which is the feature that we added a while ago that enables you to coalesce different finds for, for multiple records, um, is also, was also kind of cool and, and an internal refactor, but the, the real benefit of it came later in all the other bug fixes and features that we added with it, which is basically a much better link support for your relationships. Uh, fixes for when, if you had, for example, before the uh, find many coalescing, if you had, if it has many relationships with a couple hundred IDs, you couldn't even fetch them because you would try to make a URL for them and uh, the URL would be too long because uh, apparently URLs have length limits. And this enabled us to break out the URLs uh, by size. And it also gave, gave us much better, uh, has many belongs to relationships and, and much better support. Or for example, the snapshot code, like a couple of uh, months ago we released snapshots which are um, basically an abstraction that lets you uh, don't have side effects in your civilization code because if you have async relationships, our, our models uh, are very, you, you, it is very easy to, to cause a bunch of async requests when, when you fetch relationships. And it was, uh, it was pretty hard, almost impossible before this to serialize relationships uh, properly. But now it's very easy because in your serialized method, instead of getting our DS model, you get a snapshot of that model that lets you mess with it as much as you want to without actually modifying it or causing any side effects. So for example, now, if you get a snapshot that's a post, if you access its comments, 
you can synchronously access them whether they're loaded or not, or, or also you can also get the IDs from the snapshot. Before, if you try doing this, you would cause a bunch of requests to your backend being, being like, hey, you asked for these comments, you don't have them, let me go fetch them. And you're like, well, I'm actually giving them to you, why would you want to fetch them? I'm just trying to send you the, the model. So this was also an uh, important factor that, because it enabled this, but it also enabled a bunch of new features that we're gonna add, and, uh, and uh, you might, you'll actually see some of them today. And the last thing that, the last big refactor we landed uh, about a month ago has been the internal models refactor, uh, which basically means that if you think about your Ember models, your Ember models are things like DS model that you extend and then define yourself. But the problem is that up to a couple of months ago, we, uh, as soon as data entered the system, we were using these Ember objects you defined yourself uh, in order to st store data internally. And we have refactored that, and now we, have, we do not use your DS models to store data. We have our own JavaScript objects that are much faster, uh, and we use them to store data internally, which then enables us not only cleaner code and better performance, but much better support for things like polymorphism and sludge. Because we currently you have polymorphism in, in, in Ember data, but it's not fully fleshed out, because there were a lot of problems. For example, if, if you wanted to fetch a model, uh, whose type you didn't know beforehand, that, that was pretty much impossible because we had to create a DS model for you. And if we do not know the type, we do not know what DS model to create. Now, this is basically trivial because we keep the data in our uh, backend in, uh, in JavaScript objects. Uh, and then we basically just instantiate DS model whenever you're, you, uh, you actually need it in your templates. So this leads to much better performance and also m many more refactors. So this is basically, uh, what we have done up to a couple of months ago. This has been the last, the mo most major features and, and refactors in last about in last year of Ember data, um, and there are a lot, lot of other random fix, uh, fixes. Um, but I think one of the other important things that happened in Ember data in the last six months is that we partially kind of adopt, adopted Semver, because at some point you have to if you have users, you can't afford to keep pissing them off by with breaking changes. So for the, for the last about six to eight months of Ember data, more and more changes that we made were following Ember's model, where we deprecated stuff first and still kept the support and then added new features and just told you to, to update at your leisure. And that's basically for the last couple of months, I can't think of a single feature or, or, or change that we made that wasn't uh, followed up with a proper deprecation and, and followed up with a proper update pad the same way Ember would. So I think that basically we gradually kind of, even though we were in the, in the beta stage, uh, up, uh, started following Semver by accident almost, mostly because we already have users who use us seriously and can't, can't afford to have, to have to rewrite their apps every couple of months when they upgrade. So that kind of ties into uh, basically what, I, what today's release is about because one of the, there's a lot, I'm gonna show you a lot of exciting things, but one of, one of the, uh, biggest and most important part is to, to give you an upgrade path and, and to give you basically a sense of security, the same way you have with Ember, the same way you, you can now update to Ember 113 and refactor and go further, we want to give you the same, same sense of, of security when you use Ember data. So first, let's just think about Ember itself. First, I, I was going and looking at the first um, commit in Ember, and this is the wrong, I screwed up the link as I was refactoring stuff. The first commit in Ember was, I looked it up uh, a couple hours ago, was in April of uh, 2011. And first commit in Ember data was in uh, December of 2011. So Ember kind of had a six month start on Ember data, but if you actually think about it, it's a much, much longer start because Ember came off, well, though a completely flawed uh, Sprout core system, it, Sproutcore still had a lot, lots of years to, to polish its object model that Ember took and all the other things that Ember took from Sproutcore, while Ember data also kind of came out of Sproutcore data, but Sproutcore data was not a really impressive or uh, fully fleshed out library anyhow. So the way I, I, I think about our current position in the Ember ecosystem and, and the, the, where we are is basically that we're kind of like a year and a half behind Ember uh, because we kind of started half a year later. We are still unstable as of yesterday, and we were basically uh, had to refactor our code multiple times to kind of figure out the, the best way to, 
approach the problem of, of data storing and, and synchronization. But now, and also today, when, you, when I look at it, it really reminds me of the way I looked at Ember a year and a half ago when Ember 1.0 came out. We have, about, we have now more than 300 contributors. I actually looked up, Ember had almost around 300 contributors when 1.0 came out. Now it has like about 500. Uh, we have over 100 pages of commits on GitHub. And we also, for the last eight or nine months, we've had a Ember Data core team that meets every week, week to discuss PRs and features. And it, I think it's one of the main reasons that you have seen a lot of improvement in Ember Data is because there's this continuous uh, push and a, a continuous care uh, uh, that, that we basically put, put, put into it every week. And it really reminds me of the way Ember looked when 1.0 came out, because that is uh, when major changes to the core team happen. It, 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 it is basically when uh, they adopted Semver and they, they got behind a serious release process. So I think it's time for Ember data to basically catch the Ember train and, and, and get up to speed with Semver and get up to speed with uh, basically enabling you to build your apps with, without worrying about breaking stuff. But the problem is that we can't just leave people behind and, and tell them, hey, go, we now figured out how to do this better. And trust us, this time it, <laughs> we're not going to change it in, in six months. And we are not going to uh, make you rewrite your app in half a year again. So we, we can't afford to leave people behind without an update path. And I really wish that, this, uh, that we had an audio out here, but we don't, so I can't play music. Uh, but I would love to play Safety Dance for, for, for these uh, titles. But basically, in order to support this, and in, in order to support you updating, and in order to support you getting up to uh, Ember Data uh, stable release, I am announcing today not one, but two Ember, release, Ember Data releases. Uh, we're going to be releasing Ember Data 1.13 and Ember point Data 2 of Beta 1. Because we have spent basically We have basically spent a bunch of time making sure that we work with latest Ember. We have spent a bunch of time deprecating and ma making sure you can upgrade. And we have basically, for the last couple of months, have been syncing up with uh, Ember's progress. So what we want to do is have a final version of current Ember data that is guaranteed to work with Ember 1.13, has i8 support if you need it the same way Ember does, which is why <laughs> Our build, but why this is still not published because we still have a couple of random IE8 bugs. Uh, but yet, we want to, in the future, sync up with Ember itself. And we want to make people confident that when they get a version of Ember and a version of Ember data, that they work together and that they have the latest and best things. And that's why all the primary libraries of Ember, like, so things like Ember data, list view, Li liquid fire, will be adopting the same version numbers as Ember. So when you get an Ember 2.3, you know that there's an Ember Data 2.3 that's guaranteed to work with it. And there's a Liquid Fire 2.3 that's guaranteed to work with it. And there's a List View 2.3 that's guaranteed to work with it. So basically, in order to, to catch up with the train, we had to jump a couple of version numbers in order for maybe people here wouldn't mind as much. But if Ember is successful, I'm pretty sure that the number of people who are going to use it in the future hugely dwarfs the number of people who use it today. And when you're a newcomer to Ember, it's really important that you have the, the confidence and safety of knowing what actually you need to, do, uh, to get. And currently, if you look at it, you, it, you're basically seeing, oh, there's an Ember JS that's 1.13. There's this Ember CLI thing that's 0. something. Am I supposed to be using that? Uh, there's an Ember Data Beta. Is that like, which one should I, should I need like an Ember Beta to use Ember Data Beta? So, so that, this is the reason that we're basically going to start, go and, and sync up with uh, Ember's uh, versioning system. So as I said, Ember Data 1.13 is going to be a long-term support release in terms of security bugs only, uh, because we, uh, uh, and, and is the last release that supports IE8, the same way Ember 1.13 uh, supports IE8 and is the, the last release of, of the Ember 1.0 cycle. Um, and also, I'm going to show you a lot of new exciting things here, but the, the, for the current users, there is a, a, a plan for upgrading and deprecating that's basically the, the exactly the same as in Ember today. So basically, if you're using Ember Data today and you want to upgrade, what you need to do is you go to Ember Data 1.13, you get rid of all the deprecations, you go to Ember Data 2.0, and all your stuff is going to work. So the same way that uh, Ember 
2.0 does not introduce any new features. Ember Data 2 Beta 1 does not, except for one baking change that we could not figure out how to deprecate properly. Uh, Ember Data 2.0 also does not introduce or remove any any fully supported features. It basically just removes deprecations and made sure, made sure that you're on the right path. So, what is new in Ember Data 1.13? I think the biggest, when I think about why I use Ember and, and what I, why I like about it, well, the actual reason why I use Ember is because when I showed up to my first, first day of work, my boss told me, hey, we use Ember, and I told him, <laughs> <laughs> and I told him, what's that? Why wouldn't you use something like Backbone? But if I was to, and that's probably why my boss has a PhD and I don't, uh, but, but if I thought about it of like why, what I like the most about Ember, I think it's, it's, it's world vision of programming is hard and complex and very frustrating. And I think a lot of approaches and, and frameworks basically kind of give up on it and says the stuff we do is too complex. The only way we can move forward is if we make our things simple and easy to read and easy to, to understand. And that's the only way basically we can battle this complexity. And Ember's philosophy has a bit more of a world uh, changing view, which is basically more similar to Rails, where it says, well, yes, it's true that our stuff is hard and it's very hard to, to deal with the problems that we have, but maybe if we all work, if we all work together and, it turn, and, and solve each other's common problems, and it turns out that none of us are special, most of us are solving the exact same problems every single day, and if we solve 80% of people's problems, maybe if we join and work together, we can make tools that, are, that work conventionally and that are canonical and that allow you to, to move forward with much greater speed in the future, rather than trying to reinvent uh, your, your stack every time using small building blocks. And that's, I think, one of the only ways that we, we like, when we, people wrote first programming languages and wrote and went from assembly, you could have given up and said, this, this stuff is hard, but you didn't. You, you basically built very solid abstractions that cover 90 or 95% of cases and made us much productive and, and able to now, instead of spending years building air, airline systems, can spend months making fun mobile apps because we have basically built up all, all, all the stats up to here. So what makes me the most excited about this Ember, Ember data release is something that we have been working on for years now. And that is basically that about a month ago, JSON API released its uh, 1.0 final version. And Ember data has adopted JSON API fully. And in the 2.0 and 1.13, we'll be first having a native JSON API adapter and serializer that comes with uh, Ember data itself and is not an outside add-on. And in 2.0, it's going to become a, a, a nate, uh, basically a default way you write adapters and serializers in Ember data. It is basically the, the happiest of the happy paths, uh, <laughs> where, where we want to ensure that people, if they're starting a new app today, uh, they come to us and ask us, hey, what kind of API should I have? Uh, I know my server guys are telling me to do this, but maybe you guys also build front-end apps all the time. Can you tell me what you recommend? And that becomes like a very long and complicated discussion. And it's not going to be a long and complicated discussion anymore because we're going to tell them, just use JSON API. And we guarantee that your stuff is going to work. And then also all the JSON API extensions and support for things like pagination and filtering are coming in 2.1 uh, and 2.2 releases of Ember Data because we can reason about it and we can know what JSON API supports and we can offer native, basically, support in em Ember Data itself and make a very, very happy path. And we all, there's already a JSON API adapter you, uh, that was out for like a year now that Kirko maintained and big thanks to him. But I think that's something as important as, as conventional as APIs should really be part of core of Ember Data. So Vec uh, took all his tests and worked with him and basically rewrote all our internal tools to basically uh, use a new JSON API serialized that's going to become default in 2.0. Uh, but not only are we using a JSON API adapter serializer, we also rewrote our internal format. So if you remember, if, if you use like things like store.push, this accepted some sort of a JSON format where you had to look to, for docs that we kind of docked ourselves. Uh, this, does, this is now deprecated in 1.13. Uh, store.push that just takes a JSON API object document as, as all, all the serializer and adapter. So our serializer actually, I hyped it as this great release, but our serializer doesn't do much because all our serializer does is, is, is takes the payload process some arguments and, and gives it back to the store because our internal format in Ember Data is also becoming uh, JSON API compliant. 
Uh, this also enables a bunch of new features uh, because uh, lints, it gives us better support for lints and gives us better support for meta and all the, all the stuff that, uh, much better performance and all the stuff that people thought about uh, for uh, all, all the stuff that people thought about through years of, of trying to design JSON API are now got, become native in Ember data. Um, the other part is, so we have a new serialized adapter API. So we have a JSON API adapter and serializer. We have used JSON API as our internal format. Another thing we've done for the 2.0 release and 1.13 is we have, we have refactored our serializer and adapter API. If you have tried to extend JSON API and REST serializer, while they work pretty well and are pretty stable, they're very confusing to use because they have uh, APIs that are like extract array and extract single and normalize payload and normalize. And then you should sit there and you're like, well, what's the difference between normalizing a single thing and extracting a single thing? Am I not normalizing even I extract it? What, does, what happens here? And, and the problem, the reason that these APIs are designed like this is because if you have a payload that looks like this, where you push a single thing, if you have a very complex payload, if you have a payload that's like all the users and all the, all the teams of those users and all the admins, it's a very complex payload that can't just, couldn't have just been pushed into the store. You would have to process it and then push it one by one. The new JSON serializer is much simpler. It basically, so this is how it used to look. And if you had a payload that looks like, let's say you had a payload that had some data and some included stuff, you would have to parse it and find everything in included and then manually store that, push it, and, and, and mess with it. And that also turns that, means that your serialization layer had side effects because as you were parsing it, you were also pushing stuff into the store, and that sounds very crazy. Storing, calling something dot normalize or serialize shouldn't really affect any of your state. That makes it much less testable and much, uh, much harder to, to reason about. So we have completely refactored our serializer API, and now it look, basically looks like this. You get the response from the server, turn it into JSON API, and give it back to us, and we'll make sure it works. So it is much easier. Basically, for, for some, you basically turn whatever payload you get, you turn it into something that looks like this. And this has no side effects, has much better performance, and is much, much easier to understand. So for example, this is how uh, most of our current, the, of the new normalized function, how, the, way, the way it looks like now is much, much simpler. You basically say, hey, I want the attributes and the relationships and the ID and the type, and you just return that, and, and that's basically everything you have to do. So I think also for people who are uh, trying to design their own serializers, reasoning about how do I turn this JSON into something like JSON API is much, much easier and better than trying to figure out, okay, so what does Ember Data want me to do here? Should I be pushing these records or should I be returning them? In what cases do I need to return it and how does this whole thing work? It basically becomes a much harder, a much bigger mess and much harder to, to reason about. So I'm one, the serial as a refactor is something I'm personally very, very excited about. We worked very hard to, to refactor it and back did a bunch of work on it and, and made me very, like, looking at the method that looks like this compared to the way that our current normalization method looked like uh, makes me extremely happy. This also then, having all these new uh, serializer methods allows for much nicer metadata support because before, as you were pushing stuff, the only way to, to get or set metadata would be as a global object and that's, that uh, makes absolutely no sense. There's a bunch of use cases that are not supported by this. So we are deprecating this, this API and we are adding nicer metadata. Basically, JSON API already knows what metadata is. You can now, and we'll parse, we parse that and attach it to, to our objects. So now you can not only, is it not global, you can attach it at any level of, of, your, of, your, of, of your payload. If you want metadata for the whole request, we'll know how to parse that. If you want the metadata for a specific user, we also know how to parse that as well. And that is, is gonna enable a much easier pagination, much easier filtering, and, and uh, much easier partial attributes, and many other use cases that, are, that were very hard to support right now. So all of these new features are awesome, but <laughs> <laughs> I at least hyped a bit of the, of the upgrade part and, and deprecations. So let me tell you how you can go from your, whatever you're having now to, to uh, all this new goodness. Basically, 113, we have a couple of very clever solutions uh, that basically 113 has all the new APIs, but also is completely backwards compatible. And if you upgrade to 113, your app should continue to work with no problems. 
except you'll get a bunch of deprecation warnings. So all you have to do is go to Ember Data 1.13 to look at the deprecation warnings and fix them. And that uh, is actually not as hard as it seems because if you're using the default serializers, if you're using the default serializers, you have zero work to do. Everything will just work for you. If you're using a community supported serializer, we'll make sure to work with community authors of the adapters and serializers so in time for 2.0 to be ready so you can use it. If you have customized serializers, all you have to do is see the deprecation that tells you, hey, you have customized something in your serializer. You might want to double check if it still works with the new serializer. Uh, we'll publish a transition guide of how to convert your extract methods and whatever traces you have into the new simpler methods. And basically, you then turn on a, on a flag to say, hey, I have opted into the new API. Please let me use the new API. And in 2.0, the new API is the only API, and then your flag can just go away. But this can also be pretty stressful and annoying and, and kind of very error prone. So one, one other thing that I'm announcing today that is not re yet ready but will be for the 2.0 full release is that the Ember inspector is going to get a serialization tab. And you're going to be able to see all your methods, and how, all your serialization methods, and how they start together and, and what actually every single one of them is doing. And this is super, when I debug serializations and, 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 and normalizations, what ends up happening is I, I see my record came back and I'm expecting to see 10 IDs here, but instead of IDs, I'm seeing empty strings. So obviously one of the 10 normalization steps in the normalization pipeline failed. So let me put a breakpoint and, and spend half an hour walking through this and, and trying to understand what, what, where, which one of the methods failed. In using the Ember inspector, uh, it will be much, much easier. You'll basically just walk through it and say, and see the, 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 the results immediately and, and see what the result of every single of your normalization method is. And if you want to debug a specific one for a specific record, uh, you can basically just uh, put a checkbox and say, hey, whenever I hit this uh, uh, create record for, for this record, just uh, throw me into the debugger. And Ember Inspector can use the, the, uh, the, uh, the debug debugger APIs to basically, for, the, for Chrome, to put a breakpoint there for you. And this will lead to a much, much easier uh, debugging experience and will help you a lot if you need to debug crazy serializers or upgrade them to, to the latest serializer API. And we are also working on Ember Watson helpers that will take your existing structures and rewrite them for you. <laughs> Adolfo actually wrote one already. Uh, we are basically, we are also deprecating, we are, in 2.0 we are making async uh, relationships the default. So currently sync relationships are the default and async you need to opt into using async true, which is a very bad workflow because your relationships should be async by default and really if you, only if you're doing something super custom should you opt into sync relationships. So in the future, you, all your current code, all the sync ones by default will have to say sync true and all the, the ones you have async through don't have to say anything. But you don't have to do that yourself because if you just use Ember Watson, to, it's already in today. You can just run Ember Watson against your code base. It will go through every single of your relationships and update them automatically because it can see whether it was sync or async and just replace it for you. And there's other uh, couple of very exciting uh, Watson helpers we are working on. For example, I showed you that the push, if you use store.push, uh, with the old format, you need to turn it in, into new format, and that's very com common to do in the tests. Because of all the back compat work we had to do to keep support for both, we have a bunch of helpers that do that automatically. So we're working on, on an Ember Watson helper that will go through your entire code base, find all your store pushes, and just automatically rewrite them from the old API into the new API for you. So basically, the, you, so you can get all the mechanical stuff done out of the way and, and get 90% there to using Ember Data 2.0. So these are the, some of the things I talked about. Uh, JSON API adapter, JSON API, like basically refactoring our entire code base to support JSON API as a first class citizen. I am running out of time, but there's one, at least one more super exciting thing I really want to talk about is that is we have refactored the find APIs. Currently, Ember Data started with a simple store.find. And as any framework kind of grew into a mess from there. Because we started, okay, what do you need to get data? Let's use, you just need to say store.find and you can get a specific type, you can, for example, get all, all your users, or you can get a specific user. You can say, give me user one. But then later we were like, well, maybe you need to do a specific query. So we added store.find type with an options hash that does a query for, for that type. Then we were like, oh, maybe you need to have nested URLs and you need to preload pre some data. So we added uh, type 
ID and then like a preloaded data where, where you can say my user has a relationship with this post and you can automatically go to slash post slash user URL. Um, but then what we needed to support was maybe sometimes you don't want to use the identity map. Maybe sometimes you want to always go get the freshest data. So we added store.fetch. Uh, maybe you needed a sync, uh, maybe you just wanted to know what's in your store, so we added uh, store.getbyid. And if you look at uh, our current find APIs, they're a complete mess, because there's at least <laughs> seven or eight different methods that are all not named uh, uh, symmetrically and, and are basically very hard to understand and are not intuitive, especially for somebody new to use. So we have settled down on a couple of naming conventions and a couple of methods that are going to do all this crazy work for you. And basically, in Ember Data 113, we have added find all and find record. And every single method, if you have, uh, basically you have a find and peek. Find goes to the server, peek gives you local data. You'll have find all, you have peek all, you have uh, find record, you have peek record. And that's pretty much it. Uh, all you have, to, and, and basically, now that we have a structured API, it's much easier to pass options to your adapter. So now you can also optionally pass options to your adapter if it needs to do something uh, crazy with your API. And find record, so currently the way find behaves is it fetches data from the server first time and, and then saves data into your identity map. And otherwise, uh, then always gets you stale data and then you have to opt into uh, ref basically refreshing and you have to call reload manually. This is not a very intuitive uh, workflow, especially for somebody who's writing a very conventional app. So what we're gonna do by default in the future is render, but then fetch in the background to get the latest updates. Um, this is completely uh, customizable. If you actually always want the freshest data, it will be very easy to say find record and then reload through to force it to get only the freshest data. Um, but also, um, this works really well if in your code you know, oh, I'm doing something very important, I always want the freshest data. It, these kind of APIs that I've showed you, both the new ones and the, uh, and, and the old ones, are not very easy to use if you, for example, have an API that will give you an expires tag. If your API tells you, hey, this is a resource, it expires in 24 hours or two hours or 15 minutes, you need to refresh it after that. And there's, there, there's, there was no way for your adapter to have any say into whether you're gonna fetch something or you, you're not gonna fetch something. So we have added actually not only the, the support for manually passing options like reload or, or, or fetch in background, your adapter can also be customized and, and look at things like meta or expires header to tell you whether you need to background fetch or, or you need to wait for reload. So for, uh, my formatting got a bit messed up but there are two new adapter methods. There's actually an RFC you can look at, and there's a should refetch record is an adapter method that will take a snapshot of the record and, and tell the app, hey, this record looks very fresh, you can keep it. Or this, I looked up a meta on, the, on this record with a expires header, and you, need, you really need to go, re, you, you cannot show it to the user because it's an important record and you need to go refetch it. So basically, should refetch will tell the app whether it needs to go refetch it immediately or can show stale data to the user. And should background update is basically telling the app, hey, you have shown user your current data, should you now go and update it in the background? And maybe here you can, you can see if you're currently offline, you have no network connection, don't try to background update. If you have a network connection, go and background update. Or, if you, or, or also customize it per adapter and per meta tags. And it's also much easier now to have, if you have a store.find, for example, it was much harder to pass specific options to the adapter, especially for things like save. When you do a save, you often need to do, tell something specific uh, to your adapter. And now you can, because we have a very conventional API, you can pass things like adapter options to your adapter and it will just receive them on the snapshot. And all of this, all these new APIs are still backwards compatible. If you use them in 1.13, your code will still continue to work. You'll just get a bunch of deprecations to use the new methods. So for example, find, will, uh, because currently find that there's no background updates that could mess with your app. If you do store.find, it will behind the scene use find record and say 
to not update in, in the background. And it will tell you, hey, you seem to be using an old method. Please update and please, uh, please set your background update uh, methods if, to false if you want to keep that behavior. Or if you want your data to automatically get refreshed, set, uh, just don't touch it. Because the new default is that we will try to always background update it because we think that leads to the best user experience possible. Um, so yes, these are all fully backwards compatible and we'll just throw a bunch of deprecations. Um, a couple other things that I, have, I don't think I have time to go through. We have much better error support. We have slimmed down our errors. We had, there were a couple of issues with how errors work today in that we leave the jQuery object. We now have nice hooks that refactor your errors again into the JSON API error spec and we'll be able to work much easier and much better out of the box. Um, and yes, that is basically everything in Ember Data 1.13. In Ember Data 2.0, you're basically getting Ember Data 1.13 with a couple of breaking changes. And I don't think I have time to go through this one, but it basically, currently if, you're, if you delete something, it immediately gets uh, removed from record arrays. This makes it very hard to build good UIs that like show a spinner or gray out records. We will not do this by default, but we will make sure that if you have relationships, uh, for relationships, uh, your stuff will still work. Um, and yes, if you, so basically if you serialize stuff, you, you, even if you delete things, they, uh, they will still, uh, they will not be there. Again, so this is the only breaking change because uh, we cannot really deprecate whether records appear or not, but there'll be a very, very easy up, uh, upgrade path. So I just wanna thank, Everybody who worked on this, because it took a lot of effort, lot, lots of time, just these two releases had 46 contributors, and these are some of the people who worked, other than the core team, who worked super hard. And also some of our sponsors who donated their time, energy, money, or resources into helping us ship this. Um, so thank you, that's pretty much it. Also, as part of the 1.0 push, we have released, a lot of people have been asking me for support for partial records. How do you get a single record, if you ask for all the posts, you get all the posts that have only a name, and if you ask for a specific post, you get a name plus a bunch of other data. This is a super common request. We have released an add-on that does that really easily for you and out of the box, and will be super easy to use. I don't have time to show it to you right now, but trust me, it's pretty awesome. Words with promises and out of the box. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna have time for one question. Uh, Igor will be available to answer questions afterwards, but I know we're running pretty late today, so who's the lucky person who gets to ask the question? Don't be shy. <laughs> one person, one person, one person. Oh, there we go. Uh, are you considering support for patch? Um, I think now by default, uh, for JSON API accepts patch, so, but we're sending all the changes as of right now. We need to have better relationship tracking and relationship rollback. I see that landing sometime around 2.2 probably as soon as we finish. Oh yeah, I'll try to be faster, but uh, I, I don't think we can, we can do it before 2.2. Uh, but yes, that's, that's how we basically will add patch and relationship rollback support together because you kind of need to know what changed to rollback and to send a patch for as many. Thank you.